<laughs> Hollywood has absolutely no problem trying to replicate past successes, which is the reason Jim Belushi is in movies. But think about it. Every top grossing movie the past few years has been a reboot or a sequel. We keep remaking The Magnificent Seven. There were two Poseidon Adventure remakes in one year within six months of each other. Point is, movie studios aren't gun shy about identifying a moderate to huge success as a golden goose and then beating that goose to death with rakes to see if its grave spasms will push out another egg they can sell. So how come we don't see talking baby movies anymore? Back in the late 80s, we lost our f***ing minds over talking babies. Look Who's Talking, Look Who's Talking 2, and the TGIF sitcom Baby Talk, all coming out within two goddamn years of each other. Baby Talk had mother George Clooney in it, but not even the Cloonster could keep it on the air, and things went abruptly quiet on the talking baby front, which is ironic, if you think about it. We got Baby Geniuses a decade later, and then the short-lived TV show Baby Bob a few years after that, but even the Look Who's Talking series abandoned Jack Jawing Infants for its final installment, Look Who's Talking Now, which is just about talking animals and normal, barely literate children. And we have been making talking animal movies ever since. Homeward Bound and Homeward Bound 2, both Babe movies, all the Air Buddies movies, particularly now. We're currently living in a renaissance of wisecracking animals. Downward Dog, Dog with a Blog, Nine Lives. But there are other, way better subgenres of film that deserve a comeback, including my personal favorite, Nobody Believes Denzel. We're looking for facts, not fantasy. It's all just suppositions. I'm gonna find out the truth, I guarantee you that. Josie, you know I didn't do this. No, 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 listen to me. I'm not crazy, Shaw. Someone told them, Matthew, think about it. Number five. Cop plus dog. Taking a hard-boiled and or fastidious cop and giving them a sloppy dickhead for a partner has proven to be one of Hollywood's favorite formulas. But when you dip into a well too often, it starts to lose some of its magic. And the end result feels uninspiring, like a dead cheetah on the interstate. That's why for a brief glorious moment in 1989, Tinseltown decided to spice up the buddy cop genre by making one of the cops a dog. The first was Canine, starring aforementioned Consolation Prize Jim Belushi as a gruff police detective who's been targeted for execution by a vicious drug dealer. He refuses to take a partner, so they assign him a rambunctious canine dog named Jerry Lee instead. And Jerry Lee is a car. He doesn't follow any of Jim Belushi's instructions, which results in a fair amount of hijinks, but in all honesty suggests that he has no business being a police dog. They eventually bond, kill an astonishing number of people, and go on to star in two direct-to-video sequels, Canine P.I. and the heroically titled Canine Eleven. Never forget. Three months later, in that same golden year, Turner and Hooch was released, telling the story of insufferable neat freak Tom Hanks and his big bastard dog Hooch. Hanks inherits Hooch after Hooch's owner gets annihilated by by drug dealers. It was the 80s. All the bad guys were drug dealers. Hooch is a slobbering <laughs> balloon who destroys literally everything he touches, which doesn't sit too well with spotless detective Tom Hanks. But they put aside their differences to bring down the villainous drug peddling Craig T. Nelson. Hooch takes a bullet for Agent Cody Hanks and dies, but it's okay because Hooch has tons of unprotected sex and sent a mini Hooch screaming fatherlessly into the world before he passed. Now both of those movies were hits, but we didn't get another cop dog flick until 1995's Top Dog, wherein Chuck Norris teams up with this f***ing monster to battle a bunch of neo-Nazi terrorists in what would be the last Chuck Norris movie to actually get a theatrical release. Also, it had more or less the same tagline as K-9. So let's make some more Cop Gets a Dog movies! There's something undeniably appealing about taking the premise of a kid's movie and injecting it with white nationalist bombers, drug dealers, and murder. Just... More adult animal movies, please. Number four, Muscle Man Takes Care of Children. We've known as a culture that a man trying to care for children is intrinsically hilarious ever since 1983, when Mr. Mom came out. But then Hollywood asked the brave question, what if a really strong man tried to take care of children? And delivered the best possible answer in 1990 with Kindergarten Cop, a film about Arnold Schwarzenegger screaming at toddlers and shooting a man to death in an elementary school bathroom. It's, it's great because he's so big and they're just little sacks of child bones. Hulk Hogan, inexplicably attempting to cash in on his 1980s fame in 1993, came out with Mr. Nanny, wherein he plays an ex-wrestler turned bodyguard who gets hired to supervise the children of a wealthy inventor, and the children spend the entire movie trying to wackily murder him. That same year, we were also treated to Cop and a Half, a movie about a little boy who witnesses a murder and gets teamed up with grizzled, child-despising police detective Burt Reynolds to bring the killer to justice. Now, Burt Reynolds is technically not a muscle man, but his mustache and his general demeanor more than qualify him as a man who would be hilarious to burden with children. There seem to be peaks and valleys in the cycle of muscle man child century films because we didn't really get another one until 2000. Five's The Pacifier, featuring Vin Diesel forcibly inserting himself into a child's mouth, if the title is to be believed. The mid-2000s also brought us The Game Plan and The Tooth Fairy, both starring Dwayne The Rock Johnson as a big-time shithead who's forced to deal with children as punishment for his selfishly fabulous lifestyle. So we're overdue for another burly babysitter movie. Maybe give a crate full of babies to Jason Statham and see what happens. I don't know, maybe he'll juggle them. Number three, dinosaur buddy movies. We love the tits out of dinosaurs in the 80s and 90s. In fact, we love them so much that dinosaur movies had their own subgenre, specifically about us getting to be friends with them. Or them being friends with each other. We were very concerned about dinosaur friendships in the 80s and 90s, is what I'm saying. 1988 saw the release of two different palling around with dinosaur shows, Downer Riders 
and Denver the Last Dinosaur. Now the two shows went in wildly different directions. Denver was about a bunch of modern 1988 nerdlingers finding a dinosaur egg at the La Brea Tar Pits that hatches into some animation executive's hideous approximation of a dinosaur that immediately speaks English, wears Bret Hart sunglasses, and rides a skateboard. Dino Riders is about enslaving dinosaurs using technology and or magic crystals to fight in a future war. But both are filling the very specific need people had in 1998 to be friends with dinosaurs. A Lab Before Time came out that same year, which, in addition to teaching a generation of children about impermanence and the inevitability of death, was about talking dinosaurs chumming it up at the KT extinction. In 1991, we got Adventures in Dinosaur City, about a group of idiot children who watch a dinosaur TV show on their father's magic television and are teleported into the show, which is populated by talking dinosaurs who are all dressed like a back-to-school ad from Gulf War America. The kids team up with the dinosaurs to topple a bunch of ruthless cavemen, because indeed, man is the cruelest beast of all. That same year, ABC released its dinosaur puppet sitcom, the succinctly titled Dinosaurs, which was basically the honeymooners if everyone was wearing monster suits and blinking unnaturally. And when Jurassic Park came out in 1993, Universal Studios and Steven Spielberg doubled down on their dinosaur cauldron of child money and released We're Back, an animated movie about a team of dinosaurs who get kidnapped by a time-traveling scientist, infected with the ability to speak, and thrown into the 20th century to spend the rest of their lives imprisoned in a museum to delight the world's children. That same year, we got Prehysteria, which is about the kid from Last Action Hero finding a bunch of hamster-sized dinosaurs that are probably gonna get eaten by a cat within two weeks, but whatever, I guess make two sequels. Then, in 1995, the universe delivered Theodore Rex, a dinosaur buddy cop movie starring Whoopi Goldberg and a team of impoverished puppeteers. Then Jurassic Park 3 happened, and we didn't have another major dinosaur movie for 14 years, until Jurassic World, which is both a dinosaur murder movie and a dinosaur buddy movie! Let's hope there's not another generation-long drought. I mean, I'm 33 years old, and I would drown someone in a urinal to be friends with a dinosaur. Literally anyone. Just... just give me a name. Number two! Baby Escape Films. For a brief moment in the early 90s, America fell in love with the idea of reckless parents ignoring their infant children so powerfully that their neglect facilitates an entire zany adventure. Obviously, Home Alone and Home Alone 2 technically fall into this category, although Macaulay Culkin was not a baby at the time he was left alone to defend himself against a violent home invasion, or abandoned in New York to get chased into a tenement by two career felons who wanted to murder him. The Rugrats franchise, unleashed on the world in 1991, is all about the secret world of talking babies and their whimsical mischief, which includes stealing a younger infant to take him back to the hospital where he was born, and getting shipwrecked on an island with Tim Curry. 1992's Honey, I Blew Up the Kid has bumbling scientist Rick Moranis accidentally shoot his toddler with a laser that mutates him into a 100-foot-tall rampaging infant that briefly terrorizes Las Vegas. It is not, as the title implies, a film about detonating children. The military is called in to neutralize a giant baby, possibly because a 20-foot diaper smells like a mass grave and they don't want to risk spilling its contents all over the strip, but the baby's mom shoots herself with a grow beam and captures him long enough to return him to normal size, forever robbing us of a movie in which an infant is shot by a helicopter. It's important to to note that Honey, I Blew Up the Kid is a sequel to Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, which is another film about Rick Moranis shooting his entire family with a laser. Bebe's Kids, the story of three neglected children and the man who heroically abandons them in an amusement park to try and f their babysitter, came out the same month as Honey, I Blew Up the Kid. Now, technically speaking, only one of Bebe's kids is a baby, but he speaks with Tone Loke's voice and helps the kids steal a pirate ship and defeat Robot Nixon with the power of rap. So it counts. Two years later saw the release of Baby's Day Out, a movie about a very wealthy baby who gets kidnapped by three charmingly inept character actors and then immediately escapes their custody to go on a sightseeing adventure through New York City. There have been a few scattered others, Nobody's Baby, Super Babies, The Secret of Ronanish, but we haven't had a bubble of baby escape movies like we did in the first four years of the 90s, and I, for one, could stand to be reminded of how delightful child endangerment can be. Number one, holiday-themed horror movies. Murdering people over Christmas has been a popular subgenre of horror for years. You got Black Christmas, Silent Night, Deadly Night, Silent Night, Bloody Night, Gremlins, Christmas Evil, Jack Frost, Krampus, and the shooting star that is Santa's sleigh, a movie about WCW champion Bill Goldberg creatively maiming people to death in a Santa costume. <laughs> in the first three minutes of this film, Goldberg punts a small dog into a fan, stakes James Caan's hands to a table with carving forks, drowns Fran Drescher in a bowl full of eggnog, and sidekicks Chris Kattan through a piece of furniture. It's wonderful. But for a while, Hollywood tried to make successful horror movies about every holiday. And I want that to come back! And I'm not talking about direct-to-DVD movies or movies that incidentally take place around a holiday. I'm talking about bona fide theatrical releases wherein people are getting murdered in the spirit of the season. Valentine's Day. You got Valentine, uh, My Bloody Valentine, My Bloody Valentine 3D, Hospital Massacre, which doesn't sound like it's about Valentine's Day, but it totally is. But one of those is a remake, and two of them came out in the 70s. We need more than one of these every other decade. Halloween! That's an easy one, right? But no! It isn't! Outside of the Halloween series, there's Trick or Treat and Night of the Demons, and that's pretty much it. St. Patrick's Day. The Leprechaun series basically owns this territory. There's not, there's not really much you can do with St. Patrick's Day. You're basically just working with haunted little people. Easter! Not a single major theatrical horror movie about Easter has ever been produced. 
How hard is it to kill someone with a chocolate egg? No, seriously, I'm really asking. Thanksgiving. How is there only one killer turkey movie and zero ghost pilgrim flicks? Um, Arbor Day. Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur Ripper. Um, Earth, Earth Day. Administrative Professionals Day. Uh, Easter. Really, just throw a vengeful zombie Jesus up there. I'd pay to see that. The point is, there's no reason Christmas should be the only time of year that serial murderers and supernatural spree killers adopt as a theme. There are a lot of days in the calendar, friend. You can punch people's heads off on any holiday you choose. Oh, Boxing Day. Hey, thanks for watching the video. Please go down, like, and subscribe, and let us know in the comments what other subgenres you'd like to see come back. There's, uh, um, Ernest movies. That'd be a great one to have come back, right? How come we haven't seen an Ernest movie in a while? <sighs> Ernest.